Loving Off the Land was our 365 day challenge to ourselves to see if we could survive by only eating what we could catch, grow, harvest, or raise. And what a year it turned out to be. We certainly had many highs from discovering that we could make a coffee substitute from roasted dandelion roots. Wow, that's actually so close. Like that bitterness and the aroma and like, now I do wish I'd done this earlier. But faced our challenges as well, like having our greenhouse destroyed in our first winter storm. But to tell you this story, we're going to have to take you back to the very beginning. Steph and I first met, we were both working in the hospitality industry. And let's just say, we weren't living the healthiest of lifestyles. And just as we entered the second year of our relationship, a global pandemic hit and it would change the path of our lives forever. With supply chains breaking down and grocery stores running out of items, it made us realize just how reliant we were on corporations and big agriculture to provide us with our most basic of needs. So the ultimate question arose, could we provide enough food for ourselves to survive without them? Before we get too far into things, we also feel like we have to acknowledge our privilege. We have both grown up without ever really having to think about our food. It was always something that was available to us and we never really had to think about where it came from. And that was about to become a big reality check. We also have to recognize that we are extremely fortunate to live on a half acre property in one of the most amazing and abundant places on earth the Southern Gulf Islands in British Columbia, and the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people and the Wasanic First Nations. Between having access to the ocean and living in a sub-Mediterranean climate, it is amazing the possibilities that surrounded us for healthy, natural food. But before we got into exploring our surroundings, the first thing this pair of amateurs had to do was get to work on building a coop for our new chickens. And I'm sure you can tell from us building the coop and from how Steph cleaned it the first time, that we were as about as green as they come, and not in a good way. Almost there. Even with the coop completed, we were still months away before our chickens or eggs would be ready for us to eat. So we were relying heavily on seafood for the first few months. And what a great start it was. Pulling up traps full of crab, catching lots of lingcod, and I even lucked out and caught a massive halibut while we were trolling for salmon. But that excitement didn't last long. We were barely into the end of our second week when the boat broke down in the middle of the ocean leaving us stranded which is less than ideal to say the least when you're relying on the ocean to provide you with the majority of your food. So we're out in the water and the fucking engine seized up on me. So we're in the middle of the ocean waiting for vessel assist to come, not picking up our friend. And this does not bode well for fishing, crabbing, prawning, and all the things that we really have to do for the next three weeks. This is what happens. <laughs> We managed to scrape by for another month until it was time to harvest our first turkey. Taking the life of an animal was not something either of us had ever done before and we certainly weren't looking forward to it. This was very emotional for both of us, but this was a life-changing experience where we will never look at our food the same way. It's hard to explain to someone who hasn't done this before, but it was this exact moment that gave us a new appreciation and respect for our food that I don't think will ever go away. We are now far less wasteful with our food, and every single part of the animal is used. From boiling the bones to make soup, using the livers to make chicken liver pate, making our own bone and blood meal for the garden, and even using the unusable parts like intestines that go into our crab traps. Overall, we feel far better knowing that we've provided a good life for our animals, know how they've been treated and where our food is coming from, and ensure that we're using every single part that we possibly can.
That being said, it is definitely still an emotional experience that hasn't gotten any easier. And we were reminded of this again at the six month mark when we tried to butcher another one of our turkeys that we had definitely gotten too attached to. He was a pretty sweet bird, huh? Raising poultry was new to both of us, and after reading the millions of different views that there are online, we had no more clarity than we did when we first started. One of the opinions that we constantly went back and forth on was whether we should clip the wings of our ducks so they couldn't fly away. After putting this off for far too long and far past the recommended age, one of our ducks decided it was time to spread her wings and take off and fly out into the bay. While Steph and I panicked for hours, chasing this poor duck around the bay with a giant fishing net, we did happen to notice a couple of our neighbors sitting out on their deck enjoying a glass of wine while watching the show. After three hours, I don't know if we were more frustrated with not being able to catch the duck or with having to watch our neighbors polish off a bottle of wine after we hadn't had any in months. We decided to call it a night and hope for the best. After a restless night for Steph and I, we woke up to found Mama Duck sitting right outside the coop like nothing had even happened. And from that point on, we decided to roll the dice and let our ducks live free and come and go as they please. And so far, we haven't lost one yet. They decided to put their newfound freedom to good use and spend a lot of their time working on their log rolling skills, as most of us good Canadians do. But poultry wasn't the only thing we had in store. Two months into the challenge, we had an opportunity to adopt four more pigs to add to the homestead. And in our true amateur fashion, we put a tarp down on the back of the Explorer and off we went to pick them up. Needless to say, we got more than a few funny looks on the ferry lineup on the way home. With our protein sources starting to fall into place, we shifted our focus to some of the staples that we'd been missing. With a little research, we discovered that we could harvest salt straight from the ocean, we could grow stevia as a sugar substitute, and we could make our own milk from hazelnuts. One of the other things that we never considered that we could grow ourselves was mushrooms. After starting with one of the more traditional approaches of growing oyster mushrooms in plastic buckets, we opted for a more natural approach and started growing them in old stumps filled with used coffee grinds we got from the local bakery. We also built raised beds out of driftwood from the beach, which we layered with hardwood chips and straw, and we'll hopefully get a nice fruiting of the meko mushrooms this fall. The Pacific Northwest is also one of the best locations for foraging mushrooms, so we were able to add lots of variety to our diet as well. And variety was definitely the biggest thing for us throughout this journey. While we always had enough food, it was a lack of variety that pushed us to the edge of our breaking point sometimes. But this forced us to get creative. About four months into our journey, we wanted to cure a ham, but we had no way of making our own curing salts. After a little bit of research, we found that the main reason that people use curing salt was because it is not iodized. Iodized salt, which most salt is that you'll get from the grocery store, gives the meat a metallic flavor. Lucky for us, we had millions of gallons of unidized salt right at our doorstep. We weren't able to find a single other person who had tried curing a ham in ocean water on the internet, but we decided to give it a go anyways, and it surprisingly turned out pretty good. At the very least, it worked better than the first time we tried to smoke bacon and almost set the house on fire. Uh, and now we just got to smoke it for a couple hours, uh, and then we can have bacon and eggs! Oh my god! So, we borrowed a smoker from our neighbor, said we could borrow their smoker. Um, he did tell me the electricity part isn't working, so we kind of jerry-rigged our own thing. So we've made our own little sterner with some camp fuel wick in there, and then we're going to put some chips. Uh, into there, so we've got some mesquite smoking chips that we got. Okay, we're just going to put a couple of these in this pan. We'll put a couple more. And then the sterno should just kind of heat up that pan enough that they don't burn, but just the smoke comes off of them. And there, and then, let's do that one. We have to come in a little bit for this video, but this has got these the hooks on there. It should, theoretically. I don't know. One. And these are a little finicky. 
too. Okay, so our piece of bacon is hanging. I'm gonna light this bad boy up. Let me get a bit of a spark off there because it's homemade. Well, that's what we want. It's going now. So that should just heat up that pan for the part where that part just starts smoking. Whew. So with a little bit of a scare, we now had bacon and ham into our diets, thanks to some research on iodized salts. Wait, so if we've only been using unidized salt, how are we getting iodine? Yet another thing we haven't had to think about when it's come to our food. Historically, people have struggled to get the recommended amount of iodine into their diets, so it is now artificially added to most table salts that you would buy at the grocery store. Well, I guess it was time for us to do some more research. Luckily for us, we had already been getting some iodine through some of the seafood we have been eating regularly, but definitely not enough. The good news was, the food highest in iodine was seaweed. So off we went to get some kelp. And while this definitely wasn't our favorite, we managed to come up with a pretty good seaweed salad that we both enjoyed and ate regularly throughout our journey. We also discovered that most seaweeds are edible, and we made dehydrated chips from bladder rack that we foraged on the beach, and we also used sea asparagus as a substitute for real asparagus, which was actually one of our favorites. This brings us to about the halfway point in our journey, and it feels like we are really starting to find our groove. And while Steph took a little convincing at the beginning of the challenge, I can tell she is starting to enjoy it more and more, and she's beginning to thrive. We did a lot of fishing over the winter, and as a typical male, I spent much of the day mansplaining on how to fish properly and use the best techniques. I quickly learned to shut my mouth that day as Steph reeled in three times as many fish as I did. Woo! Got one? Number two, baby! Are you winning 2 1 now? Yeah, I am. Shit, don't oh. drop it back in the ocean. <laughs> if you drop that, that wouldn't count. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never gonna hear the end of this. I think Steph's pulled out the third. No, I think it got away. Yeah, good. <laughs> it's food for both of us, mister. I'd rather starve than listen oh, to you. But listen what? To me. what? What? That's listen a good size to one, too. Listen to you brag about beating me fishing. <laughs> oh Ay. my god. <laughs> It doesn't count until it's fully off of in the boat, man. All right, so I got three fish. Chris, how many did you get? Okay, okay. And Steph was stepping up all over the place. We had normally been working together to butcher our chickens and separating the duties, but one day Steph decided she wanted to do one all on her own from start to finish. I was starting to feel like it was me that needed to step up my game. And Steph wasn't the only one stepping up her game. We had a little extra help from our friend Simon, who comes to stay with us every How year. Hi, Hi, Stephanie. Hi. What are you going to do tomorrow? How you doing? Good. Uh, we're going to go pull up the crab traps and do some fishing tomorrow. Take out yeah, fishing trips for my life. That's right. Can I take one? I miss you. <laughs> I miss you, you too. Out? Ready? Ready. Let's hit it. <laughs> for those of you that have been following along with our journey from the beginning, you know that Simon turned out to be one of the highlights from this challenge, and he kept us motivated and working hard. Yes. Time to wake up. What? Breakfast time. Not yet. He said not yet. <laughs> I think it's time. <laughs> I think it's time. Uh. Are you ready? Are you excited, Simon? Yes. Yeah. Are you seeing the Pull, pull, pull. Uh, uh, I'm in my rope. Come on. There they are. We'll do 
we do with them? Eat them. Eat them. We found them. We found them. So, son. Yeah. See at the bottom how it's pointed? Yeah. That means it's a male. It's a male. So we can keep the males, and we can't keep the females. They'll have a rounder one. So I'll see if we can find another one. So, so I'm here. This one's too small. And, and you see how it's a female? Yeah. It's rounder there. See how those are pointy? Yeah. Do you want to pull them back? I'll put them back. Good. Do you want to hold one, son? So to make sure you don't get pinched, you hold it. Here. You put your thumb there. That's good. Show a step. Smile at me. See. Oh my, you look great. Wait, yeah. the fisherman. You can't hold me? Yeah, there you go. Perfect. And then just gently put them down with those ones. Put your thumb there. Yeah. Whoa. You're okay. I got it. Perfect. Put them down with the other ones. Son, how many crabs do we have? One, two, three, four, five. Are you psychic or what? How many did you say we were going to get? Five. You called it, man. I think that's all the crabs. I think that's all the one in this trap, anyways. I think that's all the crabs. What do we do next? We go pull up four, three more traps. We get some more? Yeah. Yeah. You tell me if they start crawling away, okay? Okay. <laughs> Hi, Mr. Crab. <laughs> What's the other two ones for? What are you doing? Hey, get out of there. Ah, Stephanie. <laughs> What's she doing? Is she stealing some? What's, she, what's going on with her? All right, good question. I got more. Okay. You got a bowl of them right there. Yep. All done? All done. High five. Dirty high five. I'll go watch that. Watch your hands. It tastes good. Yeah? Did you even chew it yet? Yummy? Yummy. Good. What about your salad? I don't have a taste. Well, not just the crab. You're going to eat the rest of it, too. Get some green in there, too. Try the lettuce. Yummy. You like yeah, it? I like it? Yeah. Yay! Yeah. That sounds healthy. Okay, mm -hmm. you enjoy. Okay. Okay. I am leaving. Are you leaving? Yes, I am. Time to go. Did you have a good trip? Yeah. Okay. Let's hit it. Okay. Okay. You say goodbye to all the chickens and the turkey? Bye, chickens. <laughs> Bye, turkey. What about the ducks? Bye, ducks. <laughs> okay, let's go. With Simon off to his next adventure, it was time for ours as well. And it was the one we had been most excited for this entire journey. Amanda's. Bees. And now it's our turn to set our bees up. Here we yeah. go. We have become so fascinated with our little bees and learned so much about these amazing creatures. Not only do they provide us with honey, but we've noticed a huge difference in our crops this year with all the extra pollinators around. Seeing this firsthand has definitely put it in perspective just how important they are to the world's food production and the human race. Guys, welcome to your new home. Nice. That's the one at the bottom. Alright, now we gotta get the queen out. Yeah, let's meet our new queen. And then the queen is in there. Can you see her? I kinda wanna make sure she's alive. Yep, she's moving. Yeah? Yeah. Let's see. The light's way better here, so it's kinda like all right, let's put the top cover back on.
right. Home sweet home. Yeah. We're waiting to see what it's like in the morning, eh? Let's see. <laughs> These little guys, I hope they're okay. Hey, buddy. Yeah, they sure pooped a lot over the suit already. <laughs> I just want to like sleep out here and watch them for hours. <laughs> yeah, totally. Alrighty. Good job, babe. Your first bee package. Ah, can we get seven more? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> already we're they're like, they're addicting. Oh, Hey guys, it's been about three days since we got our bees. Um, today we're going to take out the box that they came in, uh, as well as take out the box that the queen came in, put some more frames in to hopefully get them to produce some more honeycomb, and um, check out how they're doing. So here we go. I'm going to lift the lid very carefully. Don't want to bother them. So there's tons of bees just underneath. Um, we're gonna have to be a bit careful of this. They're all, that's crazy how they hang. So we wanna be very careful because we don't have necessarily the best gloves for this. Um, but yeah, just very gently encouraging them to get off. Maybe lean it against the other stuff there. Okay. Oh, bees. <laughs> so many bees. <laughs> you don't realize. Um, yeah, just how many were in there. Just how many were in there. And, uh, they're so active, it's great. Now, next step, we're going to take the box that they flew in out. And I'm just going to place it right beside the hive. There. And then also the sugar water that came with it. We're going to take it out for now um, so we can put the rest of the frames in the beehive and then we might put it back. We'll see how much is left. So you can see there how many, just how many bees are on that alone, which is really cool. So exciting. So exciting. Okay, so we got the frames um, in there. Uh, looks like they're doing good. They're, they seem help, healthy and happy and very <laughs> docile and friendly. So that's an amazing, amazing thing. Um, it's hard to tell how they're doing other than that because this is our first time, but uh, so far so good, I think. This face is so itchy for my hair. <laughs> I want to stay and watch them for hours, but yeah. this is their home and we have to be a little respectful, but they're just so fun to look at and watch. We'll probably leave this for a little while just so we can make sure we don't take any more and make sure they're making their honeycomb and laying babies and all that fun stuff um, but yeah exciting stuff we were so amazed at how much we were learning each week and as our knowledge expanded our waistlines were doing the opposite after months and months of healthy eating and cutting out the processed foods we were definitely starting to see the difference in our bodies and our waistlines weren't the only things that were shrinking we couldn't believe how little garbage we produced during our journey. We never really realized before, but so much of our garbage and recycling came from the packaged and processed goods we were buying from the grocery store. Cutting that out probably allowed us to reduce our garbage by over 90%. One of the other things we found fascinating was just how much edible food was already around us. There are an abundance of plants that are often overlooked simply because they are labeled weeds or just because they're not what's trendy in the grocery stores. 
We've already talked about making a substitute for coffee out of roasted dandelion roots, but we also fried up the flowers as a tasty snack as well. We had also been pulling another pesky weed out of our garden for years, horsetail, which turns out the young shoots are quite palatable and are high in nutrients due to their deep roots. We did just have to be careful to only eat these in moderation due to their high density of minerals. One of our favorite sauces was also a pesto that we made from stinging nettle. We never thought we'd be eating that as kids. A quick blanch removes the sting from the nettle and the leaves are edible and high in vitamin C, iron and other antioxidants. The leaves can also be used to make a delicious tea. And it's not just weeds that we found were edible. We were quite surprised to learn that a common backyard plant, hostas, were also edible and we found them quite tasty. We really found it astonishing the amount of edible plants, berries and roots that were right in front of our face the entire time. As we entered the final months of our challenge in the spring, our crops were coming in well and we could start to see the finish line. We also discovered new fruits and vegetables that we didn't know would grow in our climate zone, like kiwis, olives, and lemons. We continued to look for ways to be more sustainable and how we could provide our own food for our chickens, our turkeys, and our ducks. We even added some baby quail to the list of our poultry, and we also started hatching our own eggs in an incubator. While we've absolutely fallen in love with this lifestyle, with the days and hours ticking down, our focus definitely shifted to completing the challenge and having an opportunity to celebrate with some of our friends and family. We are definitely looking forward to enjoying a week, okay too, of festivities enjoying in a few of the indulgences we've missed over the year, like coffee, pizza, and a bottle of champagne. But we also can't wait to continue on our journey of self-sufficiency and share with everybody what's coming next. If you'd like to see more about our challenge and learn more about any of the topics that we've covered in more detail, you can hit subscribe below and check out some of the weekly videos that we've been posting from day one. Lots of love, Chris and Steph.